on 2020. There's a missing person. Updated location is northbound I-5. The mystery that has become an American obsession. What happened to the missing supermom? It was on this quiet country lane where every family's worst nightmare happened. A mother out jogging vanishes into thin air and just as mysteriously as she disappeared, she reappeared three weeks later. I knew she was taken. That husband and father in an undisclosed location talking only to 2020. Keith, it's Matt. Nice to meet you. How he broke yeah. the news to his four-year-old son. He said, are you looking for it? I said, everybody in the whole world is looking for it right now. The desperate search for a missing mother. The search for Sherry Papini intensifies. So at no point did you think that she may be dead? <sighs> there was a moment where we were heading back after we you know, did a few mile search. We look up and we start to see some birds circling. And I just went to my knees and uh, I thought, am I really, am I really hiking out here to look for my wife? Breaking news this Thanksgiving day, I'm Sherry Papini has been found alive. You know, prepare yourself. She's alive and you, you just gotta be happy. But uh, you know, they branded her. Who took her? What did they want? And why did they let her go? The thing she told me. Now, Matt Gutman and the entire 2020 exclusive with Sherry's husband. You're here. You're alive. It's a brisk day on November 2nd in the rural community of Mountain Gate, California, nestled in the foothills of the Cascade Mountains. And for the Papini family, it starts out like any typical morning. I remember everything about that day. Around 6.50 a.m., my wife was on her way to uh, go check on our daughter, Violet. And we met there at the uh, door. And I gave her a kiss and a hug and went right out the door. That evening, when Keith returns home from work as a Best Buy audio video specialist, he expects his usual boisterous welcome from wife Sherry and the kids. I pulled up. I, uh, I saw our, our car there, and I opened the door expecting my son comes 100 miles an hour <laughs> right at me, and then usually uh, Violet right, right behind him. We do what we call you know, our family snuggles. <laughs> Instead, he's greeted with unsettling silence. I looked in a few different rooms and I couldn't find anybody. I thought, okay, maybe, maybe they're outside. And um, I looked around outside, but at the time I was like, well, eh, you know, I'm, I'm sure they're all together. You know, I had no reason to believe otherwise. He opens up an app on his iPhone to see if he can track Sherry's location. I did the, you know, find my iPhone app and it showed where her phone was. So I assumed that's where she was, and I assumed that the kids were with her. Where did the Find My Phone app show that Sherry was, and you thought, with the kids? On uh, near our mailbox, which is a ways away. It's about a mile away, actually. Are you worried? Not quite yet. Keith jumps into his wife's car and follows the breadcrumb pings on the map toward the mailboxes. So I got in her car, and I immediately drove down to the end of my mailbox, and I was you know, anticipating I would see her but his family's whereabouts remain elusive they are nowhere in sight i then uh called my mom and asked her if they spoke and she said she hadn't keith dials his children's daycare center first thing i said is what time did sherry pick up the kids today and when she said the kids are here that was like something is wrong there's something wrong right now keith's relationship with sherry is a rare love story dating back to childhood. A storybook beginning starting with the seventh grade kids. When they reconnected years later, Keith even presented the notes she had written him back in middle school. I remembered that all these years ago, I kept her notes that she wrote me. And I dug them up and I handed her a box and of course it was like all our little notes back and forth. Soon enough, Keith would find himself on one knee asking for Sherry's hand in marriage. I was just head over heels for her, and I knew I wanted to marry this girl. The striking couple tie the knot in 2009. They look like a fairy tale couple. She like a princess, he like a prince. Their photos together seem as if they're ripped from the pages of a glossy magazine. They do just 
very sweet things for one another and just kind of things that you read out of a novel or see on TV. The young couple put down roots in their hometown just outside of Redding, California. The Papinis move into this two-story house. It's comfortable because it's the house Keith grew up in. And by all accounts, Sherry, a stay-at-home mom, treasures her family life, doting on four-year-old Tyler and two-year-old Violet and on her husband. Sherry's been called Super Mom. Where does the Super Mom name come from? She wakes up in the morning, um, has her kids dressed, their meals planned out for them and their activities for the day. And not just that, she's just a super wife. Like when she makes a pie, she doesn't just make a pie, she makes it look gorgeous. But now that super mom is missing and Keith is frantic to find her. He goes to the mailboxes where that find my phone app first pinpointed Sherry's iPhone. Again, I wasn't looking for a phone, I was looking for Sherry. When I didn't find Sherry, I went to the other road, came right back, and I parked, and I got out, and now I'm looking for a phone, because it's saying it's here, it's here. And it did not take me long. It was right off the road. Keith is stunned. It's Sherry's iPhone, lying in the grass, strands of her blonde hair tangled in the headphones. If she would have lost her phone driving home one day and she put it on the roof of the car and it fell off, okay, whatever, I could see that happening. But the cars were home and the kids were at um, school. I, I knew something was wrong. Now Keith goes into full crisis mode. He takes two pictures of Sherry's iPhone and then dials 911. I wanted to make a clear message. This is real. You need to get here now. I don't know how many phone calls 911 gets on this particular thing. 90% of the time, you know, they went to the store or they're hiding under the bed or it's, it's not that. I knew she was taken. Keith is convinced Sherry woke up that morning, went out for a jog, training for an upcoming Thanksgiving Day race. He thinks she turned out their driveway down a quiet country road, never came back. News of Sherry's disappearance quickly spread to the family. When I heard Keith's voice on the phone, I knew it was absolutely real. And when I hung up the phone, I fell down and just started crying and told my husband that my sister's gone and, and they don't know where she is. And um, I don't know if I'm ever going to see her again. A missing mother of two from Reading is now the focus of a story that is capturing nationwide attention. But how will this father tell his son why his mommy didn't come home? I picked him up and... <laughs> and uh, I told him I had something important to tell him and he... He jumped... <laughs> he jumped up on the couch with me and he knew, he knew something was up. And he said, Dad, you can tell me anything. From the foothills here in Shasta County, California, the mist can make a mountain vanish right before your eyes. That's also what happened to Sherry Papini, disappearing in broad daylight on a November afternoon. She is considered at risk uh, due to the suspicious circumstances. Within hours of Keith's 911 call, deputies are searching for Sherry. They soon get reinforcements, friends, neighbors, and complete strangers lining up to help. We're just using a map and we're doing some grid searches. The longer that someone's missing, that's a very critical time within the first, you know, 24 hours. From rushing creeks to culverts choked with brush. But for the husband of the woman who just fell off the face of the earth, it's not enough. Did I want more? Of, of course. I wanted the Marines, the Army. I want a SWAT team to break into every home in a 10-mile radius. I'm going to do everything I can to find my wife. Sherry's big sister, Sheila, and Keith's sister, Suzanne. Please bring her home. She has babies. She loves them. She's a family that loves her. Please just bring her home. Just bring Sherry home, please. What is your gut feeling at first of what might have happened to her? We still don't know. We were trying to keep a very open mind. So then we start checking with friends, family, other associates to try and put together a timeline, looking for homes that maybe had some surveillance video. And then looking to local area, 
uh, motels and hotels to see if she had been seen there. I'm sure you looked into Sherry's past. Did you we, find anything? We were looking into a little bit of everything, financials. We found where she had been uh, previously married and had been divorced. We uh, checked with her ex-husband who lives out of state and found that he had not heard or seen from, talked to her in probably six years or more. Then from this truck stop, a woman calls in a heart-stopping lead. She said that she saw a young woman that um, fit the description of Sherry Papini and that when she approached her and asked her if everything was okay, that she seemed somewhat evasive. Evasive? Maybe. But is it Sherry? No. The detectives believe that that was not Ms. Papini in that vehicle. For his part, Keith, ordinarily so private he and Sherry don't even do Facebook, begins making TV appearances. Anything to keep Sherry's face in the public eye. If we can get it everywhere, as I'm sure all of you would do if, you're, if your wife uh, or husband or whatever was missing, you would do whatever you can, and, and that's, that's what I'm doing. And so, in the late fall, in the shadow of the Cascade Mountains, a strange bumper crop of yellow ribbons and posters appears. Billboards for a nightmare. I'm just wondering about her health. Are they feeding her? You know, is she hot? Is she cold? I mean, just little horrible things that that I would go through. I would thought about that. I thought about her being there, screaming my name, and uh, that I wasn't there. And that that really, you know, that <clears throat> that really got to me. Keith admits despair hung over him like a cloud. <sighs> there was a moment where we were heading back after we you know did a few miles search and um we look up and we start to see some birds circling and then i started walking and i just went to my knees and uh i thought am i really am i really hiking out here to look for my wife and do i even want to i don't want to find her right now but i do want to find her one of my good friends came over and just you know Hugs me and let me cry on her shoulder for a little bit. And I, it was a, it was a, a very sad and a very emotional and um, angry moment for me. And I'm, I'm very glad they were with me to kind of pick me up and, and it was a, that was a, that was a tough one for me that day. All this time you're dealing with this sadness, this pain, this, this agony of fear you've still got two little kids to think about fortunately I have an amazing family and amazing friends and they really really came to the rescue on that kept them happy kept them out of this the grown-ups try to shelter them but Keith and Sherry's son and daughter are old enough to know their world has been turned upside down and after a couple of weeks, Keith can no longer keep that huge secret from his four-year-old Tyler. I told him I had something important to tell him, and he he jumped <coughs> he jumped up on the couch with me, and he knew he knew something was up, and he said, "Dad, you can tell me anything." <laughs> for a little four-year-old to say that, <laughs> I wasn't prepared for that, so I just said, uh, "Son, you know." Uh, Mommy went running and and she could she didn't come home and we're, we're all looking for her right now. We just held each other and and I said uh, he said are you looking for her? And I said everybody in the whole world is looking for her right now. <laughs> and uh, I said we're gonna find her and and we're gonna get her back. Keith had no idea whether that was a promise he could keep. Sherry may be gone, but her picture is everywhere. One day, Keith sees their son with the innocence of a four-year-old standing in front of one of those posters. He was just standing there and he had his left hand on her face. <laughs> he was just staring at her and uh, he was just sitting there, you know, tears in his eyes with his hand on her face. Solving the kidnapping of that wife and mother, Sherry Papini, begins to look impossible especially since authorities were not convinced that she'd been kidnapped. We are keeping open minds to this and we're looking at all avenues. Uh, we're not saying it is an abduction. We're not saying it is not. Could it be a voluntary disappearance? Could it be an involuntary? We don't know at this time. I know she was taken. My family knows she was taken. 
but you're obviously not gonna come out and say that abduction because you don't have the evidence and that was a little rough for me to hear but the investigation about to take a sharp turn as a new player enters the case with a radical plan to cut out the police and bring Sherry home safe all on his own. A man named Gamble ready to roll the dice. I, I didn't know if it was going to work, but I wasn't going to not try it. Stay with us. As Thanksgiving approaches, the search and rescue operation for Supermom Sherry Papini is failing. There's been no rescue, and now there's not even a search. I'm coming, honey. I'm trying. I'm doing everything I can. And uh, I love you. Still, a shell-shocked Keith Papini is keeping his wife's name in the media by granting interviews. It is very difficult for me and for my family. I would never wish this feeling upon anybody. It is taking its toll on me. There's sympathy, of course, but there's also plenty of skepticism. Police, following standard procedure, have to eliminate Keith as a suspect. Remember, the only physical evidence in the case, Sherry's cell phone, those earbuds with strands of her hair, all discovered and provided by Keith in two photos he snaps and then gives to authorities. When you saw the way that that phone was, was pictured in the photograph he sent you, did it make you think that perhaps it was staged? Um, it looked like it could have been placed there, uh, along with the earbuds being placed on top of the phone screen. Your wife vanished. Mm -hmm. But you're also the prime suspect. I never uh, felt that. You never felt that? I didn't. It never occurred to me at first that people would think it was me. I knew it wasn't him. Sherry's big sister, Sheila, never questioned her brother-in-law's innocence. She says if Sherry was a super mom, Keith was a super man. You would hope that your child or that your daughter would find someone so loving and so dedicated to their spouse. To clear any cloud of doubt, Keith Papini consents to a polygraph test. It lasts for hours. Did they ask you if you had anything to do with Sherry's disappearance? Oh, of course. And I was like, to me, I was like, no problem. Let's hurry up and get this over with. It was basically nine days before he was really cleared of suspicion. Uh, yes. Why so but long? We were going through investigating hundreds of tips, looking at cell phone data, uh, cell tower data. And did he give you um, phones, phone records, computers, all that stuff as well? Yes, he did. Keith Papini passes the polygraph, and Sheriff Tom Basenko says Keith is not a suspect. So investigators start chasing down outside tips, more than 400, but none of them lead to Sherry Papini's whereabouts. There are no suspects, there are no viable tips. Do you begin to lose hope? I don't think I ever lost hope, but it was really, it was eating away at me. Big time. I'm getting very angry and frustrated, and I, I'm scared um, for my wife. The Papini family starts a GoFundMe account. Donations start pouring in. 25, 50, 100 dollars, raising nearly 50 grand in all to find her. Then a radical idea from an anonymous donor, separate from the family, who offers a ransom for Sherry's safe return. You don't know who the anonymous person is. No. <laughs> I, it's anonymous to you as well? Yes. The nameless donor instructs the presumed kidnappers to contact a designated negotiator, a professional in this shadowy field. My name is Cameron Gamble and I'm an international kidnap and ransom consultant. I've been retained by an individual who wishes to remain anonymous. Okay, so who is this guy? He's a former Air Force senior airman who now makes his living training military, law enforcement, even private citizens on how to evade and escape capture. These are different captivity environments throughout different regions of the world. We met him at his training facility, furnished with kidnapping simulators like this shipping container where Gamble described the dark arts of his craft. What made you so confident that this was an abduction and not something else? Everything I looked at fit that bill. Look at the husband. If she was listening, I wanted to say that I, we're trying and um, uh, we're trying the best we can. He wasn't faking it. Look at Sherry herself. 
And this isn't the type of girl who's just gonna walk away from all that. By now, Keith is desperate. He's even considered turning to psychics. So when Gamble contacts him asking for permission to try a more aggressive approach, he agrees. There was no idea or thought that if I think could work, that I was not going to try. 12 days into Sherry Papini's disappearance, Gamble posts this provocative video online promoting the ransom. I don't know your motive. I don't know who you are. I don't care. I simply care about getting Sherry back. Did you ever expect someone to ring you up and say, I have Sherry, I want the money? I was hopeful. You were so convinced that Sherry was still alive. You go into these situations thinking they're dead, uh -huh. then you lose hope right off the bat. Gamble is something of a wild card. To law enforcement, he's more of a nuisance than a problem solver. Your critics would say that this is a publicity stunt. They can say that all they want. I, I don't do this for the critics. I do this for the small number that actually matter, and, and that being Keith and Sherry. But there were some big opponents to this. The sheriff was adamantly opposed yeah. to Cameron Gamble being involved in any way. For me, I was going to do everything I could to get my wife back. The next gambit for Gamble came on November 23rd, the day before Thanksgiving. He posts a second video online. The world has been looking for Sherry Papini, and now the world is going to be looking for you whoever you are. Gamble informed Sherry's alleged captors the ransom is now off the table. I'm sorry you didn't take advantage of this opportunity when you had the chance. Instead, he doubles down in a call to action asking the public to find Sherry in exchange for an even bigger reward. Was it actually a call for bounty hunters? I mean, how did you put it? I said, I don't care your criminal status. I don't care if there's a warrant out for your arrest. I don't care who you are. If you can lead us to Sherry and we give you more cash than you can spend. I wanted to make it so tempting that the abductor's own mother would have turned him in. And then what did you think about making it a bounty when the deadline for the ransom yeah. passed? Well, I was all for that. I mean... <laughs> but will Cameron Gamble's bet pay off? When we come back, the moment that would send chills down anyone's spine. I just wanted to see her, so I, I just ran past everybody and I... You know, throw up in the curtain and she was there when 2020 continues. Keith Papini begins his Thanksgiving at 3.30 a.m., stealing himself for the Northern California cold and the white hot anguish of the 22nd day without his beloved Sherry. A huge balloon release has been planned in her honor. We wanted to do something very special. A, a real close person in my life mentioned, well, what about a balloon release? You know, we're all looking for you, and here's just a symbol, here's home. And I really like that. The knife thrust pain of missing Sherry is a constant companion, as is his constantly ringing cell phone. Very early in the morning, mm -hmm. Thanksgiving Day, oh, yeah. you get a phone call. It rang, I think I was shaving at the time. So I kind of looked over and I did not recognize the number. You didn't pick it up. I didn't hear it in time because I only got the, like the last two rings. But that wasn't just any call he missed. It was the call, the call he'd been praying for. Immediately after that, my home phone rang. I pick it up, it was my wife screaming in the background, yelling my name and a CHP officer said, I need you to be calm, I need you to be calm. Well, are you panicked at first? You were hearing her scream. I'm panicked, but I'm happy, because I, I, at this point, this is the first time I've heard her voice. I know she's alive. And you hear? And I hear screaming. So then I get the phone, and oh my God, honey, and of course she's screaming, it's very emotional, and uh, I love you, I love you, I love you. Oh my God, you're, you're here, you're back, where are you? Where was she? And how did she get free from her captors? Sherry hasn't spoken publicly yet. The account of her release comes solely from what she told police and her husband. She was uh, bound. She had a chain around her waist. She had a bag over her head. I can't remember if it's her right or her left arm was chained to the chain. And her left hand was in the vehicle chained to something. Make sure she didn't jump out of the car. Yeah, they cut something to free her restraint that was holding her into the vehicle, pushed her out and drove away. Sherry has one free hand and took a bag off of her head. And she has, at this point, has no idea where she's at. She runs to a house and didn't look what she said was very inviting. She ran to another building, could not get into that building, and then ran to the uh, 
freeway. Stranded in the middle of nowhere, Sherry feels her only chance at rescue is to flag down a motorist on the highway. People were driving past her and not stopping. In her mind, she's frightened, she's scared, she's screamed so much, she said she's coughing up you know, like blood from the screaming, trying to get somebody to you know stop. Just another sign of how my wife is. She's so wonderful, but she, she's saying, well, maybe people aren't stopping because I have a chain. It looks like I broke out of prison. So she tried to tuck in the, her chain under her clothes. I, I don't know what reaction anybody has to that, but to me, I'm just like, I'm just what impressed she that she thought of that. 4 a.m. and Allison Sutton happens to be driving down I-5 North, one of millions of Americans on the road to visit family for Thanksgiving. I was in the right-hand lane, and I saw a woman frantically waving what looked like a shirt, trying to flag somebody down. She had like a wide-eyed, panicked kind of look. I was startled to see her. It was dark, and she pretty much just came out of nowhere. If I had swerved to the right the least little bit, I would have hit her with my car. I figured if she was willing to risk being hit by a car, trying to get somebody's attention, that she must really need some help. I pulled off and I dialed 911. 911 emergency. Rescue workers raced to the scene. The silence of the early morning now filling with sirens and the crackle of radio chatter. Attention station eight, unknown medical problem. It's gonna be a northbound I-5, female needs medical attention. She is uh, heavily battered. It's gonna be uh, some sort of an assault. Sherry is found in Yolo County, 150 miles from her Redding, California home. Disoriented from 22 days in captivity, she has no idea what time it is or even what day it is. The paramedics finally were talking to her. They were the first people to tell her, Happy Thanksgiving. And then she's like, oh, it's Thanksgiving night? And they said, no, it's Thanksgiving morning. Now, after that pre-dawn phone call, Keith is breaking every speed limit to get to the hospital where Sherry's been taken. The entire like hospital was like on lockdown. Eventually, they opened the door. The woman who's behind the curtain doesn't look like the wife and mother smiling back in countless family photos. One of the officers kind of like braced me and kind of put his arm around me and he said, uh, you know, prepare yourself. Um, she's alive and you, you just got to be happy. They branded her. <sighs> so I just wanted to see her. So I, I just ran past everybody and I, you know, throw open the curtain and she was there in a, in a bed and her poor face. And I just hugged her. I just held her. I felt like I hugged her for like 20 minutes. I was so happy that she was there and, and I was just kissing her all over and then I got like nauseated just looking at her. It was so hard for me to see her like that. And Keith, a couple of times you said her face, her poor face. Yeah. What did you see? The bruises were just intense. The bumps from, you know, being hit and kicked and whatever else. Everybody gets a bruise once in a while, but not these types. I mean, these are hard to look at. Her hair, she's always had very long blonde hair. You know, they, they chopped it off. I just need to know, because I, I was worried that when you first said her face, her face, that they didn't brand her face, right? I will say that no, it's not on, not on her face, no. She lost almost 15% of her body weight oh, yeah. in 22 days. Oh, yeah. That is traumatic physically. Oh, yeah. It made me sick that there is people out there that could do something like this. I just wanted to hold her. And uh, we just had her, we just embraced each other and cried together. And uh, uh, I mean, I was so happy though. I mean, how do you, how do you explain it? You're upset and everything at what happened, but you're, you're happy. As Thanksgiving morning begins to dawn, the miraculous return of Sherry Papini has not yet reached her Reading community. They gather as planned to release those balloons in the hopes of Sherry's safe homecoming.
Two hours later, the community learns their efforts were not in vain. Sherry Papini would be home for Thanksgiving. Sherry Papini, the Shasta County mother, missing for three weeks, has been found alive. The crisis may be over, but the mystery remains. Who took Sherry and why? You're really looking at somebody that's trying to break her will. That's what they do in cults. When 2020 continues. The ordeal which shattered Sherry and Keith Papini's world is over. Now the police are focused on the big questions. Who did this and why? This is simply the start of the next chapter in a very active investigation. On the day she was found, investigators are only able to get the barest nugget from the traumatized Sherry. Which was two Hispanic female adults driving a dark SUV. Anybody? Two Hispanic females in a dark colored SUV in the state of California is not much of a tip. No, it would be literally a needle in a haystack. But the next day, Sherry Papini is talking to police, part of a series of interviews in which she slowly opens up with more details of her abduction. Did she know the people she was with? No. Did she ever see them? I will share with you that their faces were always covered. I can tell you that there was, you know, guns involved. Was she overpowered? She didn't voluntarily get into a vehicle, if that's what you're asking. Very few people get abducted, just in broad daylight. Uh -huh. But the fact that there were two women mm -hmm. who were allegedly behind this is even more shocking. But also makes more sense to me. Why? If a vehicle pulled up with two big dudes in it, would you approach that vehicle being a 100-pound woman? If two women pull up and let's say they ask you for help, that makes more sense to me. Investigators say those women drove Sherry about two and a half hours nonstop that first day. And Sherry told them that her kidnappers spoke Spanish most of the time. <laughs> she literally lived through hell. The things she told me that she did acting like she was ducking in her kids and she told me one time she took some piece of cloth and rolled it up like it was violet and she would rock it <laughs> she's so strong that's the will to survive yeah suspect number one had long curly hair sir two days ago sheriff basenko went public with more details she had a thick accent she had pierced ears. Suspect number two had straight black hair with some graying color. She had thick eyebrows. Details are few since Sherry said her captors kept all but their eyes covered. Police then follow it up by gently trying to tease out more morsels of memory from the fragile Sherry. Everything becomes important. The crack in the door, an unusual picture on the wall. What did it smell like? What did it feel like? All of those things may give you proximity, particularly as you get closer to potential suspects in a case. There are several theories police could be pursuing. First up, Keith's good friend Dale says the beautiful local scenery hides a dark underbelly. There are a, a lot of bad folks around the country, and when you start digging up these rocks and looking under, maybe more so than people even understand. We found local residents talking of meth houses and police drug raids, and there are other serious concerns. While this area is really sparsely populated, what it does have a lot of are sex offenders. There are apparently about 25 registered sex offenders who live within three miles of right here. But police say they checked those leads and found nothing. Yet another theory, Keith himself and Sherry are behind an elaborate hoax. There's been some speculation online and skepticism in some media. Many reports have said that this was a little bit of a um, attention-seeking kind of couple, sort of a reality show ready to go. Keith vehemently denies it all, writing that rumors, assumptions, and hate have been both exhausting and disgusting. I think these people take cheap shots no matter what. I can't believe that somebody would get beaten that severely just to try to make some money. To Cameron Gamble, Sherry's brutal injuries point to yet another theory. 
Sherry's skin burned multiple times, police saying that vicious branding was a message, not a symbol. If you look at just human trafficking alone, a branding is something that, that would be done to uh, mark a girl from a pimp or an organization, uh, if that is in, in fact what happened here. ABC News crime expert Brad Garrett finds that sex trafficking theory doubtful. If you're going to traffic somebody, are you going to starve them, beat them, and cut their hair? You're going to do the opposite of that. You want them to look presentable so that they're, you know, to use their words, a commodity to market. As a former FBI profiler, he has a very different theory. Based on Sherry's 22 days of what Keith said were intense physical agony and severe mental torture. You're really looking at somebody that's trying to break her will and destroy her identity from the past. I mean, that's what they do in cults, to brainwash her into whatever they want her to be. And if that's the case, he says, they could still be holding other captives and even be on the hunt for more. What can you tell the people who live here to reassure them that whoever did this to Sherry, plucking her right off this stretch of road is not still out here? We don't know if this was a random abduction or a targeted abduction. But people should always take precautions for their safety. Wife is, is back with our family, and uh, still, Keith is less interested in the why than in the what's next for his family. When we return, their healing begins with an emotional reunion. I remember my little four-year-old's like, "Mommy, why are you crying? You don't cry when you're happy." And and uh, my wife said, "When you're this happy, you cry." Just over a week after his Thanksgiving miracle, Sherry Papini has been located. A rush of relief. I was ecstatic. Hallelujah! She and Keith have been reunited. Keith Papini is still marveling over all that he has to be thankful for. I had such a great support from my family, my friends, the whole community, the whole world reached out, and I'm so grateful for that. But as of tonight, so many questions about this case remain unanswered. The most horrific thing that you could ever have imagined literally almost came right to your front door. Correct, and that's the mystery. Why? I don't have the answer, and I can't explain it. The investigation is far from over. In fact, it has only begun a new chapter. The threat could still be present. Nobody knows who did it, or why they did it, or where they are. And that's gotta be terrifying for a dad like you. It's terrifying, but you know what? My family's with me now. I think of it differently now. Clearly, I want justice.